It's a wonderful season. But I realized over the years of life that there's also another way to look at the word wonder. I'll give you a couple examples, actually. You could tell what I mean by wonder by the tone in my voice. See, one type of wonder says, wow, I wonder what it's going to be like. The other type of wonder sounds like, wonder how that's going to happen. Can you tell the difference? Today, I want to talk to you about two kinds of wonder. And I want to ask you, what kind of wonder do you have? A wonder that flows from childlike faith, curious, expectant, or a wonder that's kind of like, hmm, I wonder how you're going to make that happen. And I want to invite you to open your heart that the Holy Spirit could refresh you in you and would wake up your wonder once again. Not just for the season, but beyond. Lord, we do make room for you. We thank you that you are Emmanuel, God with us. We did not come here just to play church, just to go through the motions, just to get a little Christmas sermon. We came here to meet with you, and we really do say, God, whatever you want, whenever you want it, however you want it, we're here for you. I ask in your mighty name that you would open up your scriptures through the power of the Holy Spirit, that you'd speak to each one of us, whatever you want to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, will you give a couple high fives and then find a seat? Will you thank our worship team with me too? Then they do an amazing job. All right, if you have a Bible, would you turn to Luke chapter 1? Is it okay if we read a lot of the Bible today? We're going to read a lot of it. So promise me you won't get bored. Awesome. What we're going to do today is we're going to look at a section of scripture that has two contrasting stories of two different people, but you're going to notice a lot of similarities in these two stories. Now, again, I came here today to ask you, what kind of wonder do you have? So we're going to let these two presents uh, represent these two people. These two presents are going to represent these two situations. These two presents are going to represent two promises, two situations, and two responses, and two outcomes. So I want you to notice it's going to be long But there's a lot of gold in here. And lastly, before I jump in, I want to point out that this this text, if you don't know, this is 66 different books written by 40 different authors over 1,500 years. And so the Bible is not just one genre of writing. You can't read it all the same way. And likewise, some of the scripture, it's pretty clear, like say if there's a scripture that's a, that's a commandment, it's a clear commandment to the church or, or to disciples of God, it's like, hey, go and make disciples of all nations. Like, do we need to interpret that? Well, I mean, not really. It's like, go and make disciples. We're either going to do it or not do it. It's a command, right? What we're reading today, I don't know if there's any real commands in the text, but there are surely things to be learned from the text, So I say that because what I'm inviting you into is to draw some conclusions from this narrative, from what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and what might he want you to do with the reality found in this text. Because you're not going to find like a do this or don't do this. But surely there's things that we need to learn. Amen? Okay, here we go. Luke chapter 1 starting in verse 5. I had everybody last night stand for this part because I like people standing for the reading of the word. But... It's pretty long, and so I'm going to have grace on you and let you stay seated, but don't fall asleep, okay? And try and stick with me. This is what it says. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of, of Abijah and his wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So Aaron, they were, the, they were the priestly line, so they both came in the priestly line, the husband and the wife. Now, where we're finding ourselves when it says in the days of Herod, that's the way that the scripture likes to sort of place itself in history is by calling out who the kings or the leaders were, where you're finding the story. So Herod was the king 
uh, the Roman placed king over the region of the Israelites. Uh, the Romans were occupying the land in this time, and he was the king over the area, I think about 37 BC or so, till 4 AD or so. And he was sort of a, a half Jew by race. He really wanted the Jews to love him, but they never really accepted him because he basically served Rome. So it was right in this time that if you remember, there was, as it were, 400 years of silence. What do I mean by that? I mean that from the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi, until right now in this story, God hadn't really said anything by way of prophet or otherwise to the people. J.O. preached on this last weekend. The, the people of God were left waiting and wondering when God was going to show up and when the Messiah was going to come. That's where we find ourselves after 400 years of silence. Verse 6. Talking now about Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, it says this, They were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all of the commandments and statutes of the Lord. So they were good people. They had no but. They were good people, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. So that term apparently would be used for somebody 60 and older, advanced in years, in the, in the, the Greek language. But some extra biblical, extra biblical texts say that she was 88 and he was 90. I don't know. Either way, they were past that stage in life, past the baby-making stage. Okay? They weren't newlyweds. Now, while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Not everybody got to go in. One person got to go in. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right, the right side of the altar of incense. Now watch his response. Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. Have you ever noticed that it seems like people's first response to seeing an angel of the Lord, or God show up to them is fear. You know, I think we always think like, oh man, if God would just show himself to me. We even pray that, don't we? Like, God, just, just show up in my room. Just reveal yourself. I, I, show me. Like, we just sung it. Like, show me your face. Well, what if he did show you his face? You, Yeah, like, I mean, they, they used to think if you saw the face of God, you'd die. This is why it says, like, when, when God passed before uh, Moses on the mountain that he covered his face because that was the thought. It's like, if he really shows up to you, you're going to die. So these people were scared. So he's troubled. And fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Now watch this. For your prayer has been heard. So notice the angel showed up in response to something that he had been praying for. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great in the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Now, I just got to say this. If you could be filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb, you're definitely a human being. Amen. Did you catch me? You're a human being in the womb. You deserve life. And so there's something special about John's life, that he would be set apart. It's like a Nazarite commitment for John, that he'd be set apart for God's uses and God's purposes, even from a young age. That God would use him in a mighty way. That he would go before him, he would go before God in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts to the fathers of their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Now a whole other sermon would be the subject of Elijah, but just so you know, again, the last book in the Old Testament says that Elijah will return before the Messiah comes. And even to this day, during the Passover meal, Jewish families will set a setting at the table and one seat will be left empty and it is for who? Elijah. 
And the kids go to the front door during the Passover meal every single year, and they open it, and they look for who? Elijah, because they know that Elijah has to come before the Messiah comes. And I'm telling you, Jessica and I were just in Israel, and it is so sad because now after not 400 years, but 2,400 years, they are still looking for Elijah, and they're still waiting for their Messiah, but he's already come. This is why Jesus says, hey, Elijah has come. He was John. This is powerful, you guys. John the Baptist was coming in the spirit of Elijah, preparing the way for God's chosen Messiah. Now I want you to watch how Zechariah responds to an angel of God showing up, an angel of God saying, I'm coming to answer your prayer. He says this. Zechariah says to the angel, how... Shall I know this? For I'm an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. In other words, I wonder how that's going to happen. We're old. And the angel answered him, dude, I'm Gabriel. Sometimes, you know, when you want to extend your authority, all you need to know, do is let somebody know who you are. This is why the parents say, well, why, Mom? Because I'm your mother and I said so. <laughs> so God shows up and he says, how shall I know this? And he says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I was sent to speak to you and bring you, watch this, good news. Why the attitude? And behold, now you're going to be quiet. You will be silent and unable to speak until the day that this thing takes place. Because now we, now we know from the text what was behind his question. What I found in church is that we can learn how to sort of cover up what's really in our heart by saying the right thing. You've been in church for any amount of time. You, you learn the Christianese. You kind of learn what you're supposed to say. But God has never lost on your heart. So we see, how shall I know this? And we might wonder, what kind of wonder is that? How shall I know this? How shall I know this? We know that what was behind that was doubt and disbelief. And he says, you're going to be silent because you did not believe my words, which they will be fulfilled in their time. Okay, let's jump down. That was the first meeting with this guy named Zechariah. I'm going to let this, this present represent Zechariah. And the second text that we're going to read is about our friend Mary. This, this present right here will represent Mary. Verse 26, stick with, stick with me, we're almost done. I want you to notice the similarities and the differences. In the sixth month, that is of... Elizabeth's pregnancy, she did, she did get pregnant. The angel Gabriel, same guy, was sent from God to, the city, to a city in Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Now just real quick, what betrothal meant back in that time was basically in terms of commitment, you were married, but in terms of like what you did physically, you weren't yet married. So you were committed to the person, but you didn't do married people things. Like, you didn't do make baby things, okay? Does that make sense? That's why, like, though, but if you were to break it off, it would feel more like a divorce because you were already committed. That's what that means. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and he said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. That sounds pretty good, right? But she was greatly troubled at this saying, and she tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, or Yeshua, which means God saves. And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end now watch her response and mary also asks a question how 
Same word. How will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child born inside of you will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, his wife, in her old age has also conceived a son and she's in her sixth month uh, with, with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, watch her final response. Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. May it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. You notice that both stories are very similar. They run in parallel. And so I just want to quickly walk through these two and, and, and just have us look at each character by using these presents that are here in front of you today. So first we're going to look at the person. Let's talk about who these people were, okay? What do we know about Zechariah? Zechariah was the pastor, right? He was the priest. He was the person with the title. He was the person with the position. He was the person with the stature. He was, this, he was the guy that was chosen out of everybody to go into the temple. That's who this guy was. Now, would you expect a leader, a priest, your pastors to be people of faith? Yes, you would, right? I hope as a preacher and a pastor that I'm gonna be operating in faith. That's what we would expect from this guy. Now, what do we know about her? We don't know very much about her. It doesn't tell us much about Mary. We know that she was young. We know that she was a virgin. Uh, most likely, she was probably very young, a teenager. That's kind of the age that they would get married in in that time. And, but there's, there's no stature. There's no accolades. There's no, she hadn't written a book yet. So this is just a girl. And so what should we expect out of these two? I don't know what we should expect from her, but we should definitely expect faith from him. And now both of them have an appearance. An angel of God shows up, the same angel, Gabriel, right? And what are their responses? Actually very similar. It says that he was troubled, and then it says that great fear fell upon him. It says that she was greatly troubled. And so at the appearance of the angel of God, they both responded in similar ways. Now I wonder, how would we respond? And then they both received a promise. They were similar promises. You're going to have a son. Your son is going to be great. Your son is going to do amazing things. Now, Zechariah had been praying for this exact thing, right? He had been praying for this. So God shows up and promises him exactly what was on his Christmas list. You've been asking for this. Now I'm giving it to you. I can guarantee you, Mary had not been praying for that same thing, <laughs> right? I mean, think about the contrast here. He was promised something he had been praying for for a very long time. God was finally ready to give it. She had been offered something from God that she never asked for and probably didn't want. And so they both propose a question. What was his question? How shall I know this? Now, I don't know what your version says. You might have a different version than me. But if you translate the original language, it, it actually speaks just like this. It says, uh, notice, notice the word. According to what shall I know this? That's what the term actually says. According to what shall I know this? It, let me give you my translation. Pfft, I wonder how that's going to happen. What can you say, according to what proof, am I going to know that you're telling me the truth? That's what he was saying. What kind of wonder was that? Now, in the version I read it, he started his sentence with how. How can I know this? But then she started her sentence with how. But the two questions were evidently very different. 
She says, how will this be? I am a virgin. And I think that what we're seeing between the two is two kinds of wonder. One kind of wonder that sort of hid itself behind a genuine question, but really was birthed out of disbelief. A question asking in doubt how something is even possibly going to happen. And then, but a child asking in wonder, like, how? How is that going to work? But we know from the text that his question was rooted in disbelief. And her question didn't have disbelief because the angel responds to her in there's no discipline there. And she says at the end, let it be to me according to your word. He said, according to what am I going to know? She said, according to your word, let it happen. He's like, according to what are you going to prove it to me? She says, let it be to me according to your word. Two kinds of wonder. And then what are the outcomes? Well, they both had babies. They both had boys. They both did mighty things. He just had to be silent for about 11 months. His disbelief led to some discipline. And that can happen. And her acceptance at the word of God led to her blessing, led to praise, led to her renown. They both got Christmas presents. They both had gifts offered to them. One of them received the very thing that he had always been asking for and yet wasn't able to receive it. And one of them got something that she never wanted and yet she received it in faith. When you think about your life, when you think about the things that God has given you or the things that he's chosen not to give you. How do you deal with that on the inside? We just sang a couple songs that were strategically chosen. We sang a song that says, whatever you want, whenever you want it, however you want it, have your way. When you sing that, do you really mean it? Can you come to God and say, God, I throw out my Christmas list with the things that I want and I say, God, write me your Christmas list. Give me your desires. Give me, because what I found after serving the Lord now for half my life is that even though we learn to pray the prayer, God, let your kingdom come and your will be done, if we're really honest, a lot of times what we say really is, God, would you let my kingdom come and my will be done? Isn't that sometimes what our prayer life sounds like? We go to God and what we're really praying is, God, this is what I want. Will you let it happen? Or does your prayer actually sound like, God, your kingdom, whatever you want, whatever's being done in heaven right now, I want that done here on earth, no matter what it means for me. Whether it means I get what was on my list or I don't get what was on my list, if you want it for my life, that's what I want. What kind of wonder do you have? Now I just want to close this with three conclusions or three thoughts that I drew from these passages. But again, as I speak, can I encourage you to invite the Holy Spirit to draw some conclusions for you? There, there are no explicit commandments in this text for us. So we have to approach God and say, God, what do you want me to get out of this? How do you want me to change something in my life? How do you want to correct me or train me or rebuke me, encourage me? All scripture is useful, right? So here's my three thoughts. Number one, background, position, and education does not determine faith. This is really important. Just because I have the title pastor or preacher next to my name does not mean I'm automatically filled with faith. I don't, 
I don't just wake up every morning and God says, oh, you have your degree in theology. Well, uh, you know, faith is just automatic for you. I have to wake up in the morning and choose faith just like you. And I've been learning this lesson in my life in a big way through our pastors, J.O. and Ray Dean, that, that sometimes faith is a choice. I resonate with, with Zach as a pastor, as a leader. That he, he had been praying for years for this. And yet he responded in a way that we wouldn't expect. And then Mary, we don't know anything about her, but she responded in faith. And this is point number two, that we have to determine what we're going to do with disappointment. You think about somebody like Zachariah and you think, man, you're the pastor, like you're the leader. Of all people, you should be the person filled with faith. And the more I thought about it, the more I got to wondering that maybe those facts are the very reason why he struggled with disbelief. Maybe the fact that she was young and hadn't experienced much in life yet was the reason why she was able in childlike wonder to receive. Because what I know is that the longer you go in life, especially if you're trying to live like Zach, when you know you've been righteous, when you know you've been doing what God wanted you to do, it's looking back on a life of following God in light of disappointment that actually makes it so hard, doesn't it? Because we think about the world and we can understand why somebody living like hell doesn't get what they want. But when you've been following God, you've been serving God your whole life, and you've been praying for something, and then you don't get it, that can lead you to frustration, which is unmet expectations. And so while we might look at him and question, like, how could you be so full of doubt and disbelief? An angel of God showed up. I actually think I'm like that a lot. Because I've been serving you, God. I, I've been trying to do what you've been wanting me to do. And why aren't you giving me what I thought you promised? And if we don't deal with disappointment in a healthy way, it will destroy us. What I'm learning in this season is that I can't allow myself to feel disappointed in not getting the promises that God never made to me. Well, but it's been on my Christmas list my whole life and I thought, I thought surely I would have it by now. But did God say you're gonna have it? Because if God makes you a promise, even if he makes you silent for 11 months, it's gonna happen. Even if the timeline doesn't look like what you want it to look like, it's gonna happen. In fact, most of the timelines in scripture didn't look uh, like we would expect or want them to look. He was dealing with disappointment. Surely she was dealing with disappointment. She had her five-year plan with her new husband. They were gonna go on a honeymoon. It was gonna be great. They're gonna get the dream job. They're gonna buy their little house in Nazareth on the hill. And everything was set. Everything was ready. Surely she was disappointed as well. He was disappointed and then finally got what he had been asking for. She got what she never wanted. The way they responded and the way that they received both of those promises were very different. What kind of wonder do you have? What kind of faith do you have? Lastly, we must resolve in our hearts that just like the lyrics to the song that we just sung, that whatever God wants, whenever God wants it, however God wants it, that's what we want. In fact, I don't know if you know this, but that song, we wrote that song. That's a Heart Creative original song. Let me just remind you of some of the lyrics. It says, even if there's spit in my eye, even if there's crumbs from the table, even if I'm running for my life, or even if I'm writing from a jail, that's what we sing. Where do those lyrics come from? Well, you want healing? You want healing? You've been praying for healing? Well, guess what? Jesus showed up one day, and the way that he healed a guy was he spit a loogie in the dirt, and he rubbed it in his eye. What if that guy was like, 
I'm offended at you. How dare you rub your spit, nasty dirt, mud in my eye? That's not the way that I want to be healed. Well, that's how God wanted to heal him. You know, even if I'm crumbs from the table, the Syrophoenician woman, she came asking Jesus to deliver her child of this spirit. And, and, and he's like, hey, I didn't come for you right now. I came for the children of Israel. And she's like, yeah, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the table. She responded in humility. What if she was like, well, forget you then, must some Messiah, you must be. You, oh, you wanna be anointed by God? Okay, like David, God shows up and anoints him. And then what does he do for the next 15 years of his life? He runs. Oh, I want to be like David, God. Make me like David, dancing when the ark's coming into the... I want to be a king. I want to be a leader. David ran for his life, living hell for 15 years. I want to be used by God like the Apostle Paul. Paul wrote most of his letters from jail. We think about these mighty people and they, they were used by God, but are we actually willing to receive what it is that they received? wrote this song talking the first part all about God you did this amazing thing and this amazing thing and this amazing thing and come and do that again and we love to pray those prayers do the miracles fill the temple fill my life anoint me kingdom glory but there's a lot of things that happened presents that showed up in people's under people's Christmas tree that they never asked for but evidently it was God's will for them so again, the question is, are you really willing to say in faith, God, whatever you want, whenever you want it, however you want it, have your way. What kind of wonder will you have when you approach God in faith?